First Kings chapter 14, that's our, our reading for today. Thank you so much for, for joining me. You know, as I read this chapter earlier, I kept thinking to myself, how important is godly leadership? You, you know, Solomon, he, he disobeyed God. And, and we chronicled his disobedience in some detail in past lessons. And as a result of that, here we are. God's people are divided. The, the kingdom of God is divided. And we've got 10 tribes in the northern kingdom of Israel, and we've got Judah. You know, in our reading today, in the last part of the chapter, I, I don't know why this stuck out to me, but it did. As it chronicles the demise of both King Jeroboam of the northern kingdom and King Rehoboam down in the southern kingdom in Judah. Down in verse 30, the Bible says that there was war between Rehoboam. This is 1 Kings chapter 14 and verse 30. There was war between Rehoboam. And Jeroboam continually. Brethren, these were the people of God. Through their special relationship as God's chosen people, they were to show the pagan world a better way, to show the world how great it is to belong to God, to be his people. But instead, they chose to ignore God, to, to push God out, to, to worship other so-called gods. And, and we know with Jeroboam from previous, previous chapters, we're going to look at this a little bit in, in, in our worship assembly. Um, Sunday morning. We, we know that Jeroboam chose to insert himself and to insert his worship, his sacrifices, his feast. He, he was faithless. He was fearful. He was, he was arrogant. He, he was selfish. And, and the people followed him to their demise. How important is godly leadership? You, you know, Judah was no different under the rule of Rehoboam, Solomon's son. And and in our reading today, Egypt, it tells us that they came and they took treasures out of the house of the Lord and they, they took everything. They're, they're a laughing stock. And as I'm reading this demise, I, I'm thinking to myself, you know, and I know we've made this point often, but, I, but I'll make it again without apology. Sin doesn't work. It never has and it never will. It didn't have to be this way. 1 Kings chapter 14, thank you again for joining me today. Let's read it uh, together. 1 Kings chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, it says, At that time Abijah the son of Jeroboam became sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise now and disguise yourself, so that they will not know that you were the wife of Jeroboam, who was Shiloh. Behold, uh, Hijah the prophet is, is there, who spoke concerning me that I would be king over this people. Take ten loaves with you, some cakes, and a jar of honey, and go to him. He'll tell you what will happen to the boy. Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose and went to Shiloh, and came to the house of Ahijah. Now Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were dim because of his age. Now the Lord had said to Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam is coming to inquire of you concerning her son, for he is sick. You shall say thus and, and thus to her, for it will be when she arrives that she will pretend to be another woman. When Ahijah heard that sound of her feet coming in the doorway, he said, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why do you pretend to be another woman? For I am sent to you with a harsh message. Go, say to Jeroboam, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Because I exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people Israel, and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. Yet you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments, who followed, my, who followed me with all his heart, to do only that which was right in my sight. You also have done more evil than all who were before you and have gone and made for yourself other gods and, and molten images provoke me to anger and cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, as is verse 10, I am bringing calamity on the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam every male person, both bond and free in Israel, and I will make a clean sweep of the house of Jeroboam as one sweeps away uh, dumb until it's all gone. Anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, the dogs will eat. He who dies in the field, the birds of the heavens will eat, for the Lord has spoken. Now you arise, go to your house, and when your feet shall enter the city, the child will die. And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for alone, for he alone of Jeroboam's family will come to the grave, because in him something good was found for the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel, who will cut off the house of, of Jeroboam this day and from now on. For the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, who will fruit Israel from this good land. She gave to their fathers and will scatter them beyond the Euphrates River. <coughs> Excuse me. Because they have made their Asher and provoking the Lord to anger. And he will give up Israel on account of the sins of Jeroboam, which he committed, and which he made Israel to sin. Then Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Tirzah. She entered the threshold of the house, and the child died. 
All Israel buried him and mourned for him according to the word of the Lord, which he has spoken through his servant Ahijah the prophet. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he made war and how he reigned, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. And the time that Jeroboam reigned was 22 years. He slept with his fathers, and Nadab, his son, reigned in his place. Verse 21 says, Now Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. The city was the Lord had chosen from all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was named the Ammonites. Judah did evil in sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy more than all that their fathers had done with the sins which they committed. They also built for themselves high places and sacred pillars and ashram on every hill and beneath every luxuriant tree. There were also male cult prostitutes in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. Now it happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem, took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house, and he took everything, even taking all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. So King Rehoboam made shields of bronze in their place and committed them to the care of the commanders of the guard who guarded the doorway of the king's house. And it happened as often as the king entered the house of the Lord, the guards who carried them and would bring them back into the guard's room. And the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah. There was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually. Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And his mother's name was named the Ammonites. Abijam, his son, became king. In his place. Now, what, what a depressing read that is. You know, in, in the previous chapter, Jeroboam was confronted with his sin, with his godless decisions by way of the idolatry and changes to the will of God that he had enacted. But, but he chose not to repent. And at the end of chapter 13 tells us that he was insistent, basically, in doing evil. You know, in our reading today, it begins by telling us that Jeroboam's son becomes sick. And isn't it interesting where he turns? Not to those so-called gods that, that he insisted on, on, on worshiping the altars that he had built. He turns to the Almighty God, the one true God. But in very much Jeroboam fashion, knowing that he's not right with God, he has no relationship with God, he has his wife disguise herself, and go to the prophet and to find out what will happen to his son. And the Bible tells us that the prophet is blind, but before the woman ever comes, the Lord tells him that she's coming, and she's coming in a disguise. I want you to think about just how stupid Jeroboam is. Does he really think he could disguise his wife and God wouldn't know? You know, we read that and we're appalled at, at the ignorance, at the disrespect for God. But let's camp here for a second, brother. Do we ever do this? Do we ever pretend to be someone or something we're not? Do we ever insult God in our attempts to, to fool him as if he doesn't know? And isn't it interesting? Jeroboam here, why is he seeking the Lord out now? He seemed to have no use for God in times past. I'll tell you why. Because his son is sick. And, and even he is smart enough to know that he needs God. But how insulting to God. Now, we've all been guilty of this. We edge God out of our lives. We push God out. We remove God from our lives. And we consume all of his blessings. And we give him little to no thought. And then something bad happens in our lives. And we're knocked off our feet. And we want God again. And we treat God as if he's some type of... A, a, a genie that we just get wishes from, and, but really often not concerned about a relationship with him. How insulting to God. Now, I'll just remind us, brethren, we can't fool God. He knows our hearts. He knows our feelings toward him. God knows. God, as we've seen in past readings and dealing with people, he reminds Jeroboam of all that he ha had done for him. If you go back to chapter 14 and you begin reading there at, at verse 7, it says, go say to Jeroboam, thus says the Lord God of Israel, because I've exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. Yet you've not been like my servant David who kept my commandments, who followed with all his heart to only do that which was right in my sight. You also have done more evil than all who were before you and have done and have gone and made for yourself other gods and, and molten images to provoke me to anger and cast me behind your back, he said. Look at verse 10. Uh, Therefore... Behold, I'm bringing calamity on the house uh, of Jeroboam. God tells Jeroboam, in essence, that I made you. I put you in this most prestigious position. I blessed you richly. And your response to this 
God says, I'm like, David, you haven't served me. I'm like, David, you haven't kept my commandments. You haven't followed me with all your heart. You haven't done what was right in my sight. And not only that, you've done more evil than all who were before you combined. Now, that's quite a statement, is it not? When you start combining the sins of Saul, David, and Solomon, that's quite a distinction that God places on Jeroboam. I want you to listen to that last phrase there in verse 9. He says, you have cast, this is God, you have cast me behind your back. In essence, God is pointing out how ridiculous of a response this was to his grace, to his blessings. He says, you've cast me behind your back. That's a serious charge. You know, the prophet Ezekiel made a, a similar charge against the people of God on behalf of God. In Ezekiel chapter 23 at verse 35, the prophet Ezekiel would say, therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have forgotten me and cast me behind your back. Bear now the punishment of your lewdness and your harlotries. You talk about Eric. Putting God behind you. Treating God as if he's a second or even third or fourth fiddle. Placing yourself before God. It's shameful. And you know, brethren, God shouldn't put up with it in light of his grace, in light of his mercy on our behalf. The proper response to the grace of God, I, I go back to, to, to verse 7 and following in our text. The proper response to the grace of God is just the opposite of what God uh, accuses and pronounces judgment uh, against Jeroboam by way uh, of his reaction to this grace. The proper reaction to the grace of God is to serve me, to keep his commandments, to follow God, not place him behind you, but to follow God with everything you have, to do right, to pursue righteousness, to be obsessed with righteousness as God defines right. That's the proper response to the blessings of God, to the grace of God. I'm reminded of the passage we look at all in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, where the Apostle Paul reminds us of the instructional nature of grace, the motivational aspect of grace. It says, for the grace of God has appeared, this is Titus 2 at verse 11, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lowly state and to purify for himself a people for his own possessions, that was for good deeds. The grace of God has appeared, has brought salvation to all men, and what does it do? It instructs us, it motivates us to deny ungodliness, worldly desires, to live lives of self-control, to be righteous, to be godly. You know, the grace of God is to have an impact on us. It was to have an impact on Jeroboam. Let's end with this. Let's make this as simple as I can make it, and I want this thought to, to stick with you. There's consequences to putting God behind your back. I, I would encourage you to go back and read again verses 10 through 20. What you'll read there is there are dire consequences to this. God will not and should not tolerate gross disrespect and gross disregard of him. He's done too much for us. Brethren, let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Father, thank you so much for your grace. Father, we're an undeserving people, but you loved us and you continue to love us in spite of all the many times and many ways that we've turned our back against you. Father, we're thankful for that grace. And Father, we pray that you would give us the courage, that you would give us opportunities to show our love for you. That through our gratitude, through our faithfulness to you, it will spark opportunities with others to tell them why, to tell them how good our Father has been to us. We're thankful, Father. Father, bless us this day. Bless all of those who are listening to this. And Father, again, bless us with opportunities to serve you and to serve others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.